joining us today. Uh, welcome to today's session on culturally responsive education for digital technologies. And this webinar is part of a series celebrating the launch of our CESA online courses in digital technologies. And we would love to thank Google Australia for kindly funding this webinar series and the updates um, to our courses. So in this short 30 minute session, we're going to look at culturally responsive education and what it looks like to incorporate the rich and diverse First Nations Australian histories, cultures and knowledges into the classroom for the digital technologies um, subject area. This will be a quick session. We are moving quite quickly through the content today. Um, so it'll be a rapid fire of information and resources. Um, it's really just a taster to get you into the space and know uh, where to go for more resources and further learning after this session. Uh, some of the frameworks and resources we're sharing come from the domain of mathematics education. However, uh, the knowledge is so valuable and can be transferable to digital technologies as we hope you come to see as well. So my name's Rebecca Vivian and I'm a project lead at the CESA STEM professional learning team, the University of Adelaide. And we've been very fortunate to have partnered with experts in the area of culturally responsive education, particularly in the areas of mathematics and digital technologies. We've been working with the team at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mathematics Alliance, led by CEO, Professor Chris Matthews, and have worked closely with Dr. Katie Morris over the last few years, uh, who's an ATSAMA education consultant and a project officer with us in the CESA group. And uh, Dr. Morris joins us here today. We've also been very fortunate uh, to be able to work with Jesse King, um, who is Head of Policy and Programs at the Aurora Foundation and previously who worked um, at the Stronger Smarter Institute. So some of you, many of you I know um, joining today will know Jesse and have worked with him as well. So thank you so much um, to Jesse and Katie for joining us today. We're so excited to be able to showcase some of the work uh, we've been doing with them and that they've been leading um, on in the projects. Um, I'm doing an acknowledgement of Kathy. I'm coming to you from Katha Pidinga, which is uh, commonly known as Kangaroo Island in South Australia. Those learning circles you can see on that slide are Ghana learning circles, and they're at the entrance of the University of Adelaide near the Karawira Pari or the River Torrens. The Wangu poles embody traditional ritual knowledge of the Ghana community. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge on behalf of everyone um, and pay respects uh, to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands the University of Adelaide is situated on. And we acknowledge the deep, deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country and respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land, sea, skies and waters and their cultural beliefs. Um, I've got a question here for you, or we've got a question here for you, I'd like to pose with you. It, and I would like you to have a think about this. We're going to keep moving because this is, as um, Beck said, it's a quick fire session. But share if you'd like in the chat function for um, and put it up yeah, in there or, and we'll also make this available um, through an on-demand video in your school. And, uh, yeah, go for it. I think that might be me back, <laughs> or is it oh, you? Sorry. sorry. Sorry, that's me. Um, just uh -oh. uh, for people who are joining today who like to know what's happening in the session, we're just putting a little bit of an overview. So we'll be looking at what is culturally responsive education, how do I create classroom activities that embrace First Nations histories, cultures and um, knowledges, and what are some example activities for digital technologies. So we're going to uh, hopefully cover some of those today. So what is the definition of culturally responsive education? Right around the world, there are lots of different definitions. This one comes from, this local de definition comes from an Aboriginal academic in Adelaide. Uh, culturally responsive education refers to those pedagogies that actively value and mobilise as resources 
the cultural repertoire, repertoires and intelligences that students bring to the learning relationship. What are the benefits of culturally responsive maths, uh, culturally responsive education, sorry. So if you go on to the next slide, please, Beck. It's about uh, acknowledging and valuing students' cultural identities. So students feel that they're being valued and their identities are acknowledged in the classroom. They feel respected, included and empowered to succeed, not just academically, but socially and culturally. The benefits go on to supportive learning environments that are created through uh, schools collaboration with families, with elders and Aboriginal communities. And teachers and students build positive and supportive teacher-student relationships, just so, so important. And this one, both teachers and students have high expe expectations of themselves and also of each other. In this next slide, um, Chris and I worked with, when I was working with ACARA on developing content for the maths curriculum, we, or every, every content elaboration is connected to a rich context. And those rich contexts are connected to the three key concepts in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island histories and cultures cross curriculum priority. Uh, for more information about these rich contexts, they are in the Maths in Schools um, online courses that, that you can see the um, link there. But all these contexts, all these, all these nine rich contexts transcend the learning areas of um, your curriculum, whether it's a national curriculum, Australian curriculum or your state, state curriculums, and um, particularly digital technologies. I'm just here, Katie, I've also put up a, a slide um, showing where to go. So Katie had, um, Atsuma, um, led by Katie, uh, had run a series of uh, free webinars connected and they unpacked those nine rich contexts. And they're available now on the Mathematics Hub on the webinars page where you can watch them on demand. And Katie really does a deep dive. Uh, into each of those elements. And although it's for mathematics, um, the core knowledge and understanding and th that information is valuable and you can take that and then apply it to digital technologies. Thanks, Beth. So in the, um, in, at, at, in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Maths Alliance and in those maths in schools um, professional learning packages, we work with the GUMPI model that was developed by Professor Chris Matthews it's a process that can start with either reality or in the maths cloud. Generally, when we're working with um, kids and teachers in schools, we start with a reality, which is always connected to uh, local knowledge, local languages, local culture where possible. Um, so it's adaptable, this um, GUMPI model. Um, and we were, we've been working with teachers in schools across Australia who are now uh, using the GUMPI model in other learning areas. So uh, it's great for, um, you know, developing your scope and sequence and lesson planning. There's a really, really uh, wonderful uh, teaching learning framework or pedagogical approach, as I said, not for just teaching maths, but other learning areas. Jesse, your turn. Thanks, Katie. So, yeah, I guess if we're applying, looking at the GUMPI model and looking at things like reality or maths, or in this case, digital technologies, I find the GUMPI model can be used quite interchangeably between different subject areas. Um, if you were to look at that question, what are some algorithms in your life? You probably think we're, pro we're firmly situating that in a DT context, right, in digital tech context. But if I asked you what are some sequences or rules or, or processes in your life, um, it might give you some ideas. You can pop some some ideas in the chat. I can see the chat is going off, but I think it's Cecilia um, popping links in. So feel free to throw a few. What are some processes that you would bring from from your your uh, your life and and that you could start talking about in algorithms? And when we're talking about culture responsive education models, and we can go on to the to the next slide, it's understanding that the student's reality. Is, is likely to be different from you, yours, irrespective of what culture that, that kid comes from. Could be First Nations Australian, could be Australian, could be, um, you know, all sorts of different cultures that we can, we look at as cultural beings. You know, it could be dance, could be mapping country, it could be 
creation of material cultures. It could be games. It could be the directions to the corner store. It could be the directions in or out of the community. You know, all kids are going to be able to look at it when you situate something in their reality and then you start to bridge it across in the abstract as we talk about algorithms. We start introducing the vocabulary and the language and then, well, you know, when we're talking to a computer, this is then how we do it. So you're able to then reflect it back from the digital tech and critically reflect it back into that reality of, of the students' lived experiences. So some, some really cool algorithms and there's some really good stuff on there. And I think we can go on to the next slide. Thanks, Beck. You know, make necklace making, repeating those patterns, sorting, looking at the different um, patterns that occur, adding, you know, subtracting. You can do all sorts of different algorithms around making necklaces. Um, there's some really good examples of of First Nations um, cultures in Australia that that have necklace and material culture in 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 their um, knowledge systems and their technology processes but there's also other ways you can do that with with kids as well and and it allows them to draw the link draw the link from their reality their their um experience as a, as a cultural being and a, and a human being and and then bring that into other examples sorry katie i just saw that on the notes that this was um your slide i might just steal the next slide too if that's all right you go for it <laughs> Yeah, the other really cool one with string games. Uh, people have probably played around with a rubber band and had string games, you know. So um, lots of different cultures in Australia had different types of string games, string being a very important process in, um, you know, taught from a very young age across, all across the continent around um, fibre technology and all the processes around bringing together and representing and translating knowledge using these different string games. Some really good resources on the Australian Museum that shows this. And, and I believe in the um, in, in some of the DT MOOCs, there's explanations on how you can explore using these videos and using these, these processes to help you teach um, digital technologies from, from a more culturally responsive position. Um, and, and Beck, I might pass over to you for the next slide. Yeah. Um, and so inspired by um, the use of string game, the idea of string games, as Jesse mentioned, um, we have an example in our Digital Technologies Plus X course where students are exploring and learning about string games, preferably from a First Nations um, tr traditional custodian, or if you um, are harnessing those resources on, on the museum website, um, then taking those ideas, students could ex explore uh, and recreate the ge geometric shapes that represent their own um, string, string game uh, concept or perhaps one that they've seen. And so that's when you're bringing in some of that mathematics, looking at the geometry and the patterns, um, but then taking it to another area within digital technology, students could recreate these patterns um, using visual programming um, like pencil code or even the um, general purpose programming uh, processing um, language as well. So there's lots of opportunities there for students to take these ideas and, and recreate, think about the shapes and the algorithms behind the design. Um, so I'm going to talk about algorithms and the Yulunga or Yalunga, depending where you're from, the games. It's an amazing resource that was developed in about uh, 2008. Um, this example you can see on the slide comes from the Digital Technologies Hub and was developed in collaborate. We developed in collaboration with the ESA. Yulunga means playing in the language of the Gamilaroi people of Northwestern New South Wales. And there are lots of variations of this game uh, with different mobs around Australia. So First Nation games and activities have been passed down through generations and generations of First Nations Australians. The Australian government, um, Australian, uh, the, the, the Australian Sports Commission has curated with approval from the traditional owners of the games or from representatives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, a series of these First Nation games. We call them instructive games because they all served a very um, educative um, purpose. 
and they can be used as part of school or, or a sporting program. It's re and we recommend that local elders and Indigenous groups are informed of plans and invited to participate in some way if possible. So this lesson, the example you can see on the slides on the Digital Technologies Hub, as I've said, and it's based on a game called Call Up. And you could select any of the games, though, and use the Digital Technologies Hub lesson as a framework to guide your implementation. In Yulonga, in that resource, um, if you Google it, you'll find it. It tells you where those games come from. You can see there uh, that example from on Collar. So next slide. For a digital technologies lesson, you could have students create the algorithm for the game. It, it would look something like um, breaking down the problem into smaller parts to work out the sequence and then read through the Collar game instructions and organise information using the student's own words as part of that Bumpy model teaching and learning framework displayed on a chart. To organise ideas, use, you could use headings such as getting ready, um, score setup, player turns and attempts, score updates and winning the score. And you guide students to think about the key parts of the game. Now with instructions that can be written in a sequence of steps with branching or decisions, and repeat steps or iteration. Um, you then identify the ways the instructions can be conveyed, including the use of text and images. And you could ask some of the following questions. How could we represent the game as an algorithm? What steps make up the sequence? How does it start? What patterns can you observe? How does the game end? What decisions are made? Um, look for instructions that include the word if. For example, if an event or action happens, then what happens? And are any steps repeated? And how might you show that in an algorithm? And I'd just like to uh, mention that Chris has worked with, and we both have worked with Aboriginal students and got them doing dance and then writing equations. Uh, it was amazing. First Nations Australians have developed uh, sophisticated tracking skills and an animal knowledge over thousands of years, which are today used by Indigenous rangers, um, land managers and conservationists. And in our digital technologies course, um, one of our case studies that we have highlighted is um, the first how the First Nations uh, rangers were working to develop uh, an app for the biodiversity tracking called the Tracks app. And so this app was designed by the Indigenous Desert Alliance as part of the Bilby Blitz program. Um, and it allows rangers to collect information on tracks and other signs, such as scats and diggings and burrows, uh, which help to map country where native animals are found and, and allow them to track over time. And so um, here you can see something like this case study highlights the complex knowledges and cultures that First Nations peoples hold and still actively use today, but also in terms of technical um, technology development, that this knowledge is being used to guide the development of um, innovations today as well. So in um, robotics are frequently used in the classroom for digital technologies. Um, we have a range of them on our CESA lending library that schools can access for free, such as BeeBots, Dash and Dots, Kai, Kai's Plan. And we know teachers are always searching for interesting and exciting ways to harness them across the curriculum. So one way to incorporate First Nations Australian knowledges uh, and cultures could be to look at some uh, First Nations author storybooks or perhaps using the nine rich contexts as a basis for exploring some ideas and lessons. So within the context of biodiversity mapping that we just saw within that case study, um, we've worked here with um, BeeBots. Uh, we've designed this with Jesse for our DT plus X course. Um, so we've got here a book, uh, Bush Tracks by Ross Moriarty, illustrated by Bala Orenji. And um, this could be, uh, a context or a lesson starter to get students um, thinking about animal tracking um, and how it's used. And then students could explore the creation of animal tracks, perhaps in a sand pit or drawing on paper. And we would really encourage 
the school to reach out to inviting an elder or traditional custodians in your local area to come and share their knowledges and, and information about animals and animal tracking in the local context. Students could then move into um, using the robots by creating a game. For example, um, here we have one where students are matching animal photos with the corresponding animal tracks and then um, students program the robots to move to a particular location. So um, an unplugged version could be to have students also moving around the room to different cards and cor correctly sequencing. If you're joining us today online or um, on the on-demand version, we'd love to hear some of your ideas for how you could use robots um, with some of the nine rich contexts as well. Um, another tool we have here is uh, Teachable Machines. So if you're thinking about AI in the classroom, uh, this platform allows students to simulate what it's like to train an AI model to detect images. For example, I've got here on the screen, um, I'm trying to help the AI model detect between a wombat or a bilby. Um, and you do this by creating two different categories and labeling them. And then I'm training it using lots of lots of images, which is the data. And so when I give it a new image, it should be able to predict what that photo is. So it should, um, it gives you a level of um, prediction and then students can critically reflect and think about why it worked or why it didn't work um, effectively. And so we, we have an example of this in our DT plus X course, if you're looking how, at how that lesson can be implemented. But we just wanted to highlight ESA have been um, developing in collaboration with Atsuma and, and Dr. Katie Morris, uh, a lesson plan using this tool to detect feral cats inspired by a local um, context case study. So this one's coming up very soon. So I recommend keeping an eye on the Digital Technologies Hub, perhaps subscribing to their e-newsletter as well. So this is just one example of a context that you could use with Teachable Machine. Um, but you could also work with your First Nations organisations or elders to learn about biodiversity in your local area and perhaps explore some other subjects um, or topics such as creating an AI model to detect invasive weed species um, in an area or perhaps to de detecting um, food, First Nations food and medicine knowledge as well. I love that, Beck, and I love playing with that. Um when uh, ESA alerted me to it. This um, slide shows um, some Aboriginal students that um, Beck and I worked with and Rita May um, in, uh, um, in Adelaide over the last few years. This one was last year. We These were the design challenges you could see. Uh, we've done work around Aboriginal geode geodesic architecture around the spear throw, which you can see right there. You see the students, what they developed, what they um, they created their own. Uh, you can see some basket through there. Um, again, there's the spear thrower. So they designed them and then they used virtual reality and um, other digital technologies to create them. It was absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, such wonderful examples of bringing juxtaposing technologies that have been yeah. developed thousands of years with um, cutting edge top technologies, digital technologies as well. So some great, some great work there with, with those kids in the Aboriginal STEM Congress. And with that one, we also introduced design thinking and um, got them thinking about user-centered design and designing for the user, um, which was excellent to see um, them apply those processes as well. Um, there's also, if you're looking for some content and inspiration, uh, there's a great four-part documentary series called The First Inventors, which celebrates and explores um, First Nations, Australian peoples and innovation. Um, this show um, also is really fascinating because it, it showcases the use of digital tools to investigate and document and showcase, um, you know, the long, enduring, rich history of cultures and knowledges. So we just thought we would play the first 45 seconds in case you haven't seen it, just to give you a bit of a snapshot of um, the content within that series. 
until the broader Australian community really understands the complexity, um, the knowledge within First Nations cultures, we really will have a barrier towards true reconciliation. The First Inventors is um, a four-part series, documentary series, that's looking at the innovations and the science within First Nations cultures. It really starts to answer the question of why are First Nations cultures in Australia the world's longest surviving continuous culture? It looks at the innovations, the way First Nations people have worked with country, the wisdom, the kinship systems, pretty much everything within society that allowed these cultures to thrive and survive. There are no less than 22 First Nations groups which can recall a time. So that was just a little bit of a, a snapshot there um, and a book that Katie recommends frequently, um, Young Dark Emu. Katie, did you want to share a little bit about that one? Uh, yeah, it's just um, got amazing chapters in there um, around different uh, material culture. It, it talks about the um, brain belt. It's got examples of um, there's a whole chapter on home around Aboriginal architecture, and it debunks a lot, a lot of the a lot of myths that have been circulating for 220 years about um, First Nations material culture and um, you know the ingenuity and and. The first about the first inventors is just amazing, and I do I know it's controversial, isn't it, Jesse? But there's some great stuff in it, and it's been really well researched by Bruce Pascoe. So it's probably in every library in every school. So connecting with community, I know a lot of teachers we hear all the time that teachers don't know where to start. There's a fear. Um, some some teachers don't do anything for fear of offending, but uh, our key message to you is to be brave, connect with community. You'll get told if you do something wrong. I did. <laughs> and you make a difference. And it's absolutely fundamental where you can to connect with community in as many different ways as possible. Um, and we've got some stepping stones there. The least, uh, the first is about acknowledging people, culture and country and place within your, within your classrooms, within your work, um, local, local mobs or, or more broadly. Um, secondly, about consulting, really important to consult with Aboriginal educators, community elders and other community members. And then the best thing is um, collaborating with Aboriginal educators, community elders and community members. And there are Aboriginal education consultative groups in some states and territories, and I know they're about to have a research. So look out for those um, education consultative groups. Yeah, really Katie, I'm on... Oh. Thanks. Right. Sorry, Kate. I might just shout under that. Like, you know, don't 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 try and set yourself up to to run before you can walk. Draw some concentric circles around that model, right? And where do you think about with yourself and where you're developing your ability to acknowledge what you need to do to consult materials and collaborate with others for this work, but then lean into that next um the next relational weave with people through your schools, through through your safe spaces and your and your structures like your AECGs. Um, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, I need to consult with the community or collaborate when they want to go out and do some really complex stuff, um, which is great when it works, but it takes a lot of skill development and trust to be built with that community. So you can also look at that um you know, sort of three-dimensionally from the, the linear approach of those things, but also then how does it expand out with your networks and with um, and how do you increase the networks available to you through building relationships? So just to think 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 relationally as well as sequentially with, with that framework. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Jesse. Um, and so that brings us to the end of our session today. We hope that, um, you know, we've been able to give you some uh, starting information and some places to go as well as some initial ideas for you to explore as well as um, where to go for more ideas. Um, we've got some links here if you're interested in any of our courses. Um, we're so lucky to have Jesse King uh, work with us and consult on the development of those courses. So jump onto our website. Um, we've got a few there and some new ones coming up. Um, also, just highlighting on the Maths Hub, uh, there's those, uh, there's our free courses that cover culturally responsive pedagogy developed by 
Atsuma, um, the content there. We also have that three-part webinar series. So I'm just flagging that although it's for mathematics, you can transfer that valuable knowledge um, across to digital technologies. Um, also, be sure to check out the Atsuma website. Um, they provide access to lesson resources, exclusive webinars for partnering members. There's a biannual conference, which is just absolutely incredible. I was so lucky to go to the last one. Um, it's, uh, they also have regular newsletter updates, which have um, some excellent information and, and content there. Um, so thank you so much for joining our session today. If you're um, joining us uh, now, we would just love you to just take a few minutes, it's only four minutes of your time, uh, just to provide us with some feedback on the session today. Uh, this helps us uh, learn how we can target future professional learning and how we can improve our sessions and also to keep these kinds of sessions going. I would like to say thank you so much to uh, Jesse King and Dr. Katie Morris for joining us today and for, you know, all the knowledge that you're sharing and the work that you've been doing with us. We've been so fortunate at Caesar and we look forward to continuing to work with you both as well. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Great drawings there too. Well done. Yes. Thanks yeah. everyone.